Thank you so much for coming. Oh my gosh, there's so many different faces. <laughs> Worlds collide and quiet down, and they collide here tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to be reading for just about 13 minutes. Um, a few <laughs> different sections of the book. I'm going to start with um, a very shortened version of the opening, Annabelle Begins. Christmas Eve, 1930, Park Ridge, Illinois. Annabelle Begins. When the year turns, there are bells on the wind. All the old years fall on the ground in lights. When you walk across those lights, it sounds like walking on all the piled up leaves of giant trees. But up high, the bells are ringing for everyone alive. There's silver and gold and glass bells you can see through, and sleigh bells a hundred years old. My grandmother said there was a whisper for each one dead that year, and a feather drifting for each one waiting to be born. My mother says that's just a story, but I always do hear the bells, even in my sleep, and everything in front of me is all white and open like a field. Then I start dreaming. The trees in my dreams sparkle. It's quiet in the dark, and I'm indoors on a stage. The trees are behind me, but they're alive, touching limbs and stirred just so. A silent spirit seems to move among them, and the light has found me. It's a large theater, rows and rows, and a balcony I glimpse through the gleam. The audience is quiet, waiting for me to speak. Perhaps they're watching a play, my play, or a play in which I perform. I can't make out faces beyond the footlights, but I see the tilt of heads and the shapes of ladies' hats, and a glow seems to float amongst them. There's a hum of admiration or excitement, and a swell of whisper like applause. Then the lights on the stage darken. I hear people weeping. So moved are they by the production. Grandmother used to say I might find myself upon a stage one day as an actor. Duty is our Boston Terrier that follows heart everywhere and sleeps on our beds by turns. Betty brought him from the pound and Mother let him stay. Duty's in my dream. I stand on the stage before the trees and Duty's there sleep just at the edge of the light. His little legs are stubby and his chest is broad and his short brown coat shines like a mirror. Duty's eyes are wide apart and he can seem to gaze in two directions. But he only looks off toward the wings to where no one can see. Grandmother always told me that our dreams are wishes or fancies, gifts of the dream fairies that guide and care for us in our sleep. She said that poems and stories are the whisperings of angels we cannot see, beings once like you and me who know more than we can know while we are here. Address me in your mind when I'm gone, Grandmother told me. I will hear you always and will send a reply in the sounds of the grass and the wind and other little signs. We no longer speak in words when we have slipped away. I fed her with a teaspoon. She could not hold the cup. She talked about the silken cord that binds her soul to mine. She slept and woke, and slept and woke. The cord is a real cord, and I keep it under my pillow. Not all of it, once it was very long, the last of the silk braid mother used on the sofa pillows. Grandmother gave, made a game of it for walking through the park. We children went afternoons with Grandmother single file holding to the cord. She used to say there was one of her and three of us. We children must hold to the cord just so. She fashioned one large knot for each right hand, and I was first behind her. We held to the cord in silence, for Grandmother liked us to hear small sounds. The cricket and the mantis, the grasses moving in the meadow. Sound travels even the cord we hold, Grandmother said, but the heart beats in the hand. You're not like others, Grandmother liked to tell me. Your dreams see past us. The trees in my dreams shine like trees on a glittery valentine. The sparkle looks like snow catching light, or drops of rain held fast. It's a wonderful effect. Living trees could stand on a stage in pots of earth, and the limbs might move on wires gently, as though stirred by a breath. Grandmother told me, when she was still up and sitting in her chair, that she would sleep longer and longer, and then not wake up. She said her death would be a blessed death, and one she wished for me when I am very old. Grandmother can hear me. I do believe so. And I hear her voice and words that come to me. Perhaps she sent me the dream about the trees. I could hear a sigh in the branches, a bare whisper. 
No doubt there was a fan off stage, flowing a breath of motion. Grandmother used to say, so little can move so much. Uh, you may know a little bit about the story of Quiet Dell. It is a real story. The names in the book are all real except for a few I won't mention. <laughs> you know it in the acknowledgments of which ones we made up. Um, Annabelle is nine. Her brother Hart is 12. Her older sister Greta is 14. And her mother has been corresponding through the National Friendship Society with one Cornelius Pearson, a gentleman of property. Um, and you may know that they decide to marry while they're corresponding, and he comes and he and asked to leave for a trip to see his properties and to spend some time together. And he returns a week later to bring the children, they think, to rejoin their mother. There is a part of my book called The Child's Journey that is the journey with Cornelius Pearson. Um, and this is the moment when that journey turns uh, dark or to one of transformation. And this is from Annabelle's point of view. It takes place in July of 1931. A sick smell, quickly sweet, fists her shut until the car door opens like a bottom and drops her out. The sluice of water is on her face and all around her, for she's fallen into a lake and someone pulls her roughly through long brown grass that clings and tries to hold her. The car door slams. She gasps, swallowing rain. She's in his arms, crushed close. Where's Hart? Where's Greta? Inside, my dear, out of the rain. What is this place? One of my properties. I'm afraid you're car sick. Would you like to walk or shall I carry you? This mud will ruin your shoes. He's nearly shouting over the rain. She's dizzy. The downpour tumbling around her. She struggles to stand and he keeps his hand upon her. We'll just wait while it's dry until I can rescue our automobile from the ditch. Annabelle sees the garage building through driving rain in the dark and knows about the basement rooms. It's like a shoebox cut in squares. Deep down inside where he was pounding, driving nails, making the walls thick and black. Stairs steep as a ladder go below. She sees it from above with the roof ripped off and the smell steaming out, a butcher shop smell pouring out like a pot boiling over. She sees the trap door standing open and Pearson pushing someone she can't see down the hole. She begins to run, dodging his hand, and he chases her, grabs her by her clothes as her shoes fly off in the mud. He hits her so hard that she flies back against the car. There's a shattering inside her, glass falling apart and splinters too small to count. She sees then from above, Pearson stuffing her muddy shoes in his pocket. She herself moves easily high above him, as though a string of yarn unwinding from a skein might connect her to that other girl below. She sees that she's wearing her grandmother's slippers, but they fit perfectly and are no longer worn, but look new. They shine and bear her up. There's no rain here, though she sees the rain, a shifting downward mass of transparent color. She finds herself in some new element, moving as a swimmer might tread water, and rises further still. She thinks to call for her mother, but knows her mother's not here. Greta and Hart, though, perhaps are here. She sees Pearson, dark, hunched and wet, a furry, swollen spider sidled here and there by the mud that rises in ridges when he tries to pass. He pulls the girl by her bound hands. That is not she, Annabelle knows, for she is looking down at him. She can see the bright rain and smell the mud clinging to itself like the mercury that fell out of grandmother's broken thermometer. Rain floods the muddy clearing in dense green woods separating and running in rivulets, tossing and stirring and dredging up the ground that is black and thick as chocolate. Then she's on the road with Pearson before her. She moves toward him, trying to reach the girl, to slide her from him. But there's only a trace of motion when she moves her hands, a shimmer. He pulls the child by the rope that binds her wrists, feeling around in the mud with his hand for her shoes, to stop them back in his pockets. 
Annabelle sees across the road. Her rag doll, Mrs. Pomeroy, in wet mud beside the car, where she fell and Pearson pulled Annabelle out, for the doll had been her pillow. Annabelle must have her. She moves close in a terrible, slow drift that cannot grasp the belted dress or fabric face. Her hand disappears in what she sees. She thinks about the inside of the car, somewhere dry and safe, and sees Mrs. Pomeroy wedged deep into the fold of the back seat. His hand will not find her. She's only cotton batting, crushed and squeezed so small. The cord about her waist is grandmother's golden cord, the cord that binds one soul to another. Annabelle sees the cord then, longer, thicker, shiny, tied to a rafter, where she's inside the dim garage. Rain hammers the roof. A long trap door lies flung open, and rough wooden steps disappear into the dark below. Annabelle touches the cord and feels instead her grandmother's silken hand, reaching for her as though across a great distance. The air around her swells and brightens. Her own grandmother is here, clear and luminous. Annabelle sees in the shadowy garage, as though by candlelight, a mess of clothes and objects on the floor, open boxes and trunks. But her grandmother has only to move her arm and beckon to pull Annabelle near and lift them up high and higher above the hulk of the building, the muddy road, the rain. Annabelle sees forests and meadows, green squares and deep valleys, half lit in sunlight, shading dark as near the garage and its hidden rooms. She hears the meadow creatures and their sounds, flicks and whirs of song and flight rise and flow all around her so distinctly as though she's high above. The dark is gone. So Annabelle continues throughout the novel. Um, and just as the first part starts, Annabelle begins, the sort of second, second part begins with a section called Emily Begins. Emily is a 35-year-old reporter from the Chicago Tribune who is more or less um, invited to write the story of what is happening. And she goes to West Virginia, kind of driving all night to arrive at the garage as um, everything is being discovered in a section called Discovery. So here Emily is arriving at the garage. I might also say that there's a dog named Tony, the Iker's dog, um, who's left behind when the family disappears. And Emily decides that since he knows Pearson Powers, uh, he's a material witness, and she takes the dog with her and ends up adopting him. Emily breathed in the crushed green smells of earth, wild mustard, honeysuckle, and then a darker scent. They pulled carefully onto an open dirt swath before the garage, which was rude and small, square, flat roof with wooden doors in front. The crowd, perhaps 200 or more, stood quietly, all looked toward the back of the building. Emily heard then the pounding of pickaxes and the slough of dirt shoveled and thrown. The smell was the ditch, uncovered. They're gone now, she told herself. They're not here, not even their bodies. But the men were still digging, and the crowd was waiting. A quiet restlessness moved among them. Few spoke, and only in lowered voices. The ditch, a deep gash, ran straight some 40 or 50 feet from the garage to the back of the lot. Beauty struggled forward on the leash, dragging Emily to the very edge of the ditch. It seemed he might jump in, and the thought horrified her. The ditch was muddy and wet, for it opened into a little creek whose dark green water lay nearly still, barely visible through the towering weeds along its banks. Scrub trees, purple weeds, stocky blooms, taller than the men who stood near them. Was that Queen Anne's lace grown to such a height? The white flowers were the size of parasols. The smaller ditch, the uncovered gas line, bisected the large one. The two indentions formed a shape very like a cross, emptied into the water. Emily turned, pulling the dog with her, peering past the disturbed ground as far as the horizon. 
The creek looked no more than 15 feet across, and she could see the water move, a glowing lip against the opposite shore and gently descending meadow. Heavy limbed trees stood silhouetted in the field, their canopies sudden stirring. The sky was pale blue against the darker earth, and the creek seemed to mark a line between one world and another. She imagined walking across the water, leading duty on the leash to that other empty meadow that lay bathed in the softest, pearlized light. But none of them on this side were worthy of that place. I'm going to finish with this little section, which immediately follows Emily's arrival. Annabelle can dream when she's awake and waken in her sleep, or she's never asleep, but always dreaming. She moves above or through the urgency of people moving and doing. She turns away at will and bridges great distances in the breadth of a thought. She's here in the place grandmother called the low, Narrow dirt roads spread through the mountains. Drawn closer, she sees throngs of people crowded near the hunched garage. Lines of metal glint in angled curves. The tops of many black cars. The glass of the windscreen sparkles and catches the sun. She sees the long, bright car that pulls up last. A woman gets out, with duty on the leash. Annabelle hears the click of the leash moving and smells the trampled grass, dung earth. So many shoes and boots and mingled bodies. She knows she smells what duty smells. She cannot feel the weight of him or the warmth, but senses him intensely, for nothing separates her now from those for whom she longs so deeply. Duty turns his head confused. His long mournful search is over. He has found them. Emily stands beside the dark splash of the ground. Duty drags at the leash. He smells some remnant mixed in the earth and pulls Emily to the dirt edge of the gash. He would leap into the dark, roll in it and taste it, as with dead things at home, a squashed bird, a rabbit torn by cats. Annabelle waits in the meadow across the creek. There's no death here, no danger. Birds take wing like glimmers rising up. Rabbits wear their closed wounds like flowers. She knows the gash across the creek is dense and black, deepening tugging at the crowd's garage. People standing near are quiet, as though gathered for a meeting of great import. Across the way, light flashes from the roof of the garage, like an eye that opens while the ground is sifted and pulled. Deep in the gash, the glow begins. They found something. They murmur that something is found. Annabelle hears Duty barking as he used to bark at home. The crowd is shifting and moving, and she sees Duty pull Emily toward her training at the leash. Thank you. Okay. First of all, thank you and congratulations. Well, thanks for being here. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk about this book um, for any number of reasons. Um, I don't know. I wanted to see how many people in this audience, and there are a lot of you, have ever read true crime. Okay, most, uh, nearly everybody. I read a lot of it. Um, I like it. I love your fiction. And I'm so intrigued by a, I guess, the striking and strategic decision that you made at the outset um, to not dwell on you know, to excess the sensationalized quality of the crime at, at the heart of this book, but to at, at not to define the characters by the way their lives ended, but to imagine their lives. Mm -hmm. And um, you said somewhere, I, I read somewhere you said that, oh, um, that the worst tragedy you felt was um, lives that were unseen and not remembered. And I, if you would do one thing before, I, I know I'm talking and asking you five questions at once, but for those of you who didn't maybe see the wonderful book trailer, um, would you just tell the audience how you first heard of the events that took place in Quiet Dell, the last place something like this should have happened, Quiet Dell, but about your mother? Well, can you hear me? Yes. Um, 
as the trailer explains, um, I grew up in a little town, and Quieto was a tiny hamlet of maybe a hundred people. Um, and my family had been in West Virginia since the 1700s, and my mother, at age six, this crime was so sensationalized, and there were so many newspaper stories about it that, according to the newspapers of the day, which I'm sure couldn't have been correct, 50,000 people. That did seem high. It seems high. But many thousands of people walked past the crime site and continued to um, almost make pilgrimages there because it was, um, as Sergeant, as uh, Sheriff Grimm tells Emily in the book, um, it wasn't of them, it was something forced upon them. Um, he assures her that Powers, as he's known in West Virginia, Pearson one, was one of his aliases, Powers uh, is not homegrown. Um, and that all of these people to whom this has happened are strangers and that it almost seems darkly magical and the press certainly played it as a warning and lesson to women and a warning about sexuality itself, about how powerful and uh, dark it could be. Um, if you had uh, what we would consider normal desires, look where it might land you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, and to correspond with a stranger, uh, even though the American Friendship Society was a very, uh, it, it gave the impression that it was for gentle women and, and that sort of thing. Um, it almost sounds like it could be a Quaker uh, society. But it was the pre early precursor of Match.com, and uh, <laughs> it was all about matrimony. There was no dating, and, and so much of life then was about letters. People really yeah. wrote letters, and they wrote letters daily, and Powers was writing to over 200 women. That's what I wanted to double check with you. I came across that figure, and I thought at the time he was caught, they found that he really was corresponding with 200 other potential victims. Well, her had been over the past been. four years. Okay. Um, okay. And I don't want to say too much about it because it's it's all you know. You discover many things about him in the novel, and every almost everything is based on fact, um, except for Emily's intuitions, um, which and I think I, I think I personally think she was right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in terms of what she does sort of put together or, or mm -hmm. discover. But, um, you know, I feel as though a life is not defined by its brevity. Mm -hmm. It's defined by, it, by its intensity. And the, the idea behind fiction, I think, is to allow a reader to enter a life through a kind of um, complex empathy. Yes. To really feel that life. And I think or I hope that you feel each one of these children. Um, and there is a sense of adjacent dimensions, you know, all the way yes. through the book, really. Mm -hmm. From the very beginning, uh, in the sort of beautiful Christmas section, um, the reader is aware in ways the characters are not. Um, that Annabelle's slightly strange pronouncements, which people are accustomed to hearing from her, um, actually do in some way foreshadow something that is going to happen. And if, if it's going yeah. to happen, what does that mean? That's a real mystery. Well, it, and it's, it's very successfully sustained. I don't think she loses mystery. Um, um, one thing I like about the books uh, is that you don't seek to explain away mystery, you promote it. Um, not in a scrambling, what's happening kind of way, just honoring it, that it exists. And, and, but I want to back up a little bit. So you heard the story. I heard the story from my young, mother. Very young. When I was maybe, surely I wasn't as young as Annabelle, but I, I right. would say 11 or 12. And it wasn't that she dwelled on it. No, no. But, but um, and I remember the detail that really stayed with me was the tops, you know, so many cars as far as she could see and the sound of them taking apart the building for souvenirs. For souvenirs, the garage where the, this was done. So what I'm fascinated by, really, and I don't know the answer, I, I, I don't, I'm eager to ask you this. You grow up knowing about this. It's in your town. Um, at what point 
um, in your thinking about writing this, you refer to this as your hidden book, which I also want to know what that meant to you. But at what point did you think, did you feel um, assured and, um, you know, in your ability to take this on? That at what point did you find a way in that made sense to you to imagining real lives, as you said, not, not wanting them defined by brevity and, and horror, but how do, you, how do you do that? How do you make that leap of, not just imagination, but imagination with, I think, a kind of built-in allegiance to honoring these these victims. For people who were real, yeah. Real. So how do you, at what point do you, how do you get there? I think just over a very long period of time, you know, um, many years ago, it must have been 20 years ago, I discovered uh, an old book called Love Crimes of Harry Powers in the, in my hometown library. And I Xeroxed the entire book. <laughs> Um, I, I had some sort of idea about something. I mean, I was just interested, you know, because I really didn't know that much about the case, just the sort of bare outlines. Uh, and then I was moving, and I discovered this Xerox manuscript, and I started to do some research, and I saw some photographs of the children. The ones in the book. The ones in the okay. book. And I've actually been carrying this little Xerox around in my wallet for years. And there was something about Annabelle's gaze in the photograph that just kind of went through me. And um, many years ago, there was uh, something called First Night in Boston. A friend of mine, Clara Wainwright, actually started First Night. It has ended now, sadly. But maybe the second or third year that First Night was happening, and it's, something that, it's a festival that takes place on New Year's Day, ice sculptures and events all over the city and someone, uh, their idea was to build a big um, sculpture called the Oracle and it was on Government Plaza and they asked different writers to just contribute poems or uh, snippets of stories and I contributed something that was became the first two paragraphs of Quiet Dell and it was supposed to be a child's voice about the turning of the year and the idea of the grandmother and um, I began to think about those words, and I realized they were the beginning of this novel. Um, and I had in mind, I think we, you know, we always, I mean, at least I always have allies in the writing of a book, and one of my allies was the little match girl story. Um, there was not really, I'm giving something away here, there was not really a grandmother, but it was very important to me that there be a grandmother in this story. Uh, who is, and they do have sort of that kind of relationship. Um, there's a sort of shoe theme that kind of runs through the book. And I was quite a ways into the novel when I discovered David Lang's music, um, The Little Match Girl Passion, in which all the words of the fairy tale are inside the music. Um, so all of these sort of elements became um, allies in the writing of the book. And my research had to be very spotty because it all happened 83 years ago. There was very little real information. Mm -hmm. But the information I found was amazing. And, and there's it, a fair amount of it in the book. Yeah. But the, the, in, the information that I got through the internet from total strangers, and it would just be something tiny like... He liked to take watches away from people, take them apart, put them back together again. That is, he was smart. <laughs> um, he learned English faster than anyone in the family. Uh, strange little things. Um, so as you, you know, as some reviews have remarked, it's, it's a novel that figures around a murderer, but it doesn't really spend a lot of time with him. He appears, but what appears, what's more involved in the book is, what is he? You know, what is the mystery inside him? Um, and I think the book thinks about it in a particular way. 
Well, I agree. And, and, and I, again, I like that that's not the most compelling. It's certainly compelling, but it's not the most compelling part of the book. At least it wasn't to me. And it's uh, people who have just even open the, the first few pages of the book tonight know that uh, you can see that you dedicated the book to Annabelle, the otherworldly nine-year-old, the youngest, the shortest life in this book. And because of what we heard, you heard some of it uh, in what you read, but that quality in her immediately sets her apart and, and, and sort of allows her um, a, a lyricism in voice and in act that is kind of transcendent, but believably so um, throughout. So, and some of the most um, beautiful writing has to do with her. So I wanted to, to, to sort of leap from Annabelle, the figure of Annabelle, and you've mentioned the little match girl as being a favorite story and um, and Dickens and is about, very yeah, there's a kind of Dickensian a <coughs> a sort of Dickensian Dickens. feel to mm -hmm. the way events happen but talk about the, talk about the there's a very interesting <coughs> inner structure the way you assemble a sort of almost a play or a story within the greater novel and it's it's complex and it's very interesting and um, I wonder if you'd say just a little bit about that, involving the uh, some of the epigraphs from Robert Louis Stevenson and the the fairy tale. There's a fairy tale quality. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hit you over the head, but it's certainly there. Could you say something about and that? And the these snippets of the the books that Annabelle read, mm -hmm. sort of classics of children's literature, are mixed in with real uh, snippets of newspaper articles mm -hmm. from the time. Right. And the juxtaposition is, it's sort of adjacent dimensions again. Mm -hmm. um, something as base as taking this building apart for souvenirs to something as spiritual as um, the little quote from the dead and um, quote from the little match girl yes. and yes. quotes yes. from A Christmas Carol yeah. mm -hmm. because Scrooge's voyage, Scrooge's movement for, through past, present, and future was, I was sort of thinking about that as a model for the way that Annabelle is able to move. But Scrooge, of course, was a very guilty person, and Annabelle is an innocent. Um, so her experience is very different from his. Um, so it was just imagining all that and sort of being inside that world and inventing sort of a fairy tale within the dark tale within the tale. Because Annabelle's play, of course, is also in the book her actual little tale within a tale. Right. Um, so it wasn't necessarily something I planned. It was mm -hmm. just simply something that developed in the book. Well, that's what it seems. It doesn't seem like you thought, oh, here's an idea. I, I've, I'll just stick this on it. <laughs> you know, it, 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 does, it feels of it. It feels like it did come from it. And there are, there are, there are things that you could not make up in fiction about this story, and that was one of the great pleasures for me. And I don't want to give anything away, so tell me if I can say or not say some of the names. The sheriff. Oh, think, you I mentioned think, one. The I think sheriff. we can say the names. Uh, sheriff Grimm, G-R-I-M-M. -M. Sheriff Grimm was Who's the sheriff in West Virginia. Uh -huh. um, the, the Gore Hotel. The Gore, Gore is a very, hotel. you know, it's a very respected name in the South. It was the, the, the principals during the trial stayed at the Gore Hotel. The district attorney. The district attorney's name was J. Ed Law. Um, the judge's name was Judge Southern. I'm not going to tell you the real name, the given name of Harry Powers. It's Cornelius so good. Pearson, I won't say it. We're not going to say it because you're just going to discover it in the book. But it's it was unbelievable. Amazing. Amazing. Um, and makes total sense in reality. Yeah, um, and let's not forget the, the Associated Press just called the little dog Duty, whose duty it was to guard the kids. They, uh, the AP just said Duty was one of the um, the best dogs in fiction. Duty, Duty, D U T Y. I this, thought it sounds like something. Duty's story was true. It, you see the clipping right in the book. Yeah. I did not make it up. It's a heartbreaker. You couldn't make this up. No one would believe it. But Duty, who is not a pretty dog, Mimily remarks. I on beg this. to differ. Okay. <laughs> he's a singular dog, and he's not a young dog. I mean, 
because the family adopts him when his first family is wiped out by a tornado. So the Eichers are his second family, and when they disappear, he is orphaned again. And that's why the newspaper clippings of duty, across, you know, newspapers across the country, picture of duty, very nice. He's a bull terrier. Uh, Boston terrier. No, no, this says bull terrier. Well, we had, to, we, had to, we had to change I'm it to Boston I'm arguing with terrier. the author. I'm well, arguing with was, the author. It was, it was a bull terrier in the, in the galley. <laughs> but we, we had to change it to Boston Terrier because Duty was a little smaller than, you know, yeah, so he's a, he's a he, but he's not a purebred Boston Terrier. I read the galley. Um, um, yeah, he, you could not make up, you know, this name. So there were pictures of Duty with the, with the legend twice bereft yeah. and then the story bereft that he was orphaned. And, and, but, but one of the wonderful things, too, that you can do because you are a fiction writer is take the best of the factual information and then imagine, imagine a way out of the hopelessness and the uh, unspeakable losses and, and sadness. And you in, in the characters that you didn't invent whole, um, and there aren't many of them, but they, um, and I don't want to give away much uh, or anything, but, but, but they really do, um, there's a quote, wait, I'm just, I'm going to find a quote. There is um, the young reporter you mentioned, the, the female reporter. Emily Thornhill, yep. Um, is, is, you say, largely, I think largely defined by her belief that, and here's a quote, one must mount a defense to save what could not save itself. And, and I, th I felt that the made up characters sort of step in, as a, it sounds corny to say as a force for good, but as a, as a counterpoint and a way to deal with what's unbearable. Well, the names that all those real names in the case are like a fairy tale. It's just unbelievable. The coincidence of the names and they suggested a kind of extended fairy tale or extended story that had a kind of Dickensian arc to it. Um, so, I mean, now these characters, I mean, Emily Thornhill, yes, she's good in a way, but she would have been quite castigated in her own time. Yeah, she's she not completely is good. an adulteress. She has a long-term relationship with a man who's married to an invalid wife. Mm -hmm. She consorts with homosexuals. Um, she's not a conventional person, and she keeps her private life very private. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of secrets in the book. Yeah, I was saying uh, they're, they're all private, um, and, and then carefully um, find intimacy, you know, with, with each other. But um, you've mentioned, I think, is this correct, that your, um, your mother, the, the, that Emily Thornhill, the character, is something of an homage to your mother? Well, only in the sense that she never gives up, uh, you know, and, and she will intervene, and she's willing to intervene, but she's very unlike my mother. My mother prized convention highly. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, there's another quote. Um, where is it? If I can find it. Um, this goes back to, um, obviously, you have written wonderful books um, um, long before this one, though this story was maybe one of the first stories you heard as a child. And um, wondering why now. And you say, um, this is in an interview in the LA Times, as to timing, I had other books to write before this one. I think of my work as a continuum in which I investigate and experience perception itself, which I thought was such an interesting um, way to put it. Um, and so I guess I'm still asking you why now, and I'm not I don't know exactly when you started writing. I think you said you made notes on this book for quite a while. The hidden book. Well, was it, hidden? it was hidden because I'd never written about, I've certainly written about things that really happened or they've been at the core of my of other books. But this was really 
being um, being true to the actual story and yet completely transforming slash inventing the thoughts, perceptions, relationships of these real characters. Um, and I felt it all had to be hidden. Um, it wasn't ever excerptable. That is, I could, couldn't publish any of it anywhere because I didn't want anyone to know what it was about. I was terrified that someone else would write a novel about, I mean, this is crazy, I suppose, that someone else would write a novel called Quiet Dell before I could finish this book. Well, um, it kind of happens. <laughs> you know, it could have happened. Um, and the whole, the whole experience of doing it and the attempt to do it was hidden. You know, I didn't talk to anybody about what it was about. I didn't like the idea that, you know, I, I could be writing this for five years and someone could just go to the internet and put in the words and see all these horrible sites that mentioned his name, but never theirs. Or at least they were, they were nothing. And um, I think um, Emily says, something, one of the reviews said something about love. Um, love was the angle. Love was, the, love was her the angle. It was always her angle. It was her angle in that she was more or less forced to do the, the woman's take on whatever she wrote about. Right. Love, of course, was her angle, and then she sort of undercuts to say what she really was saying. Well, she surpasses it. That's what she was yeah. assigned. That was her role, but yeah. she goes beyond that. There... <laughs> I just my I just landed on a quote that um, um, <laughs> uh, it, it's from earlier in the book about the um, the the women who trusted they they hoped for ordinary things fidelity and and you know um, safety safety and and they really trusted they were doing something that was okay um, in a modest way with these marriage bureaus and. Then, then you have this line, but woe to the buxom woman over 40 who imagines sincere interest in her exhausted charms. And I thought, <laughs> whoa, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty severe. <laughs> well, people only live to be 52 then. Well, that's true. <laughs> good point, good so, point. <laughs> yes, okay. That was my last question. <laughs> so if you have a question for Jane and Amy, please raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone on. Thank you. Uh, I've read the novel and I love it. Thank you. Um, I, I, when I read it, I was thinking so much about, we seem to live in an age of mashups. You know, where people are often appropriating or borrowing, sometimes they're crediting, sometimes they're not. And you began this began thinking about it a while ago, it seems almost as if the culture has matured into the book that you wanted to write. And I, in a way, I'm glad it's come out now because I think people are generally more accepting of the idea that we can borrow from uh, fiction to write fiction and the use of transcripts and photographs. I, I, I'm glad it's out now. I'm sure you're glad it's done, period. <laughs> now it seems, it seems to me that now is the right time for a book like this that borrows from different channels. Well, you know, I hope you're right. Um, but to me, the fascinating thing was that I was inside this invented world, and yet the the snippets of the articles, there were the names of my characters. So it kept underscoring the reality all the way through. And the photographs, and it was just an incredible boon, I mean, to have this sort of back bone in a way of reality and yet all the meaning was really inside the fiction that is trying to give it a meaning that was different um, had to be completely invented. I have a labor-intensive day job. Some of my students are here. <laughs> um, that has its own incredible sort of challenges and blessings. 
Um, but because of that, I tend to write only in the summers because I really need a space, uh, a long space of time that's un, uh, in which no one can reach me and, and I can really descend into the material of the book. Um, and I think, too, the whole business of not being able to write for a while increases the pressure so that when I'm finally able to turn to the book, it feels, it's incredibly intense. Um, it feels very risky and scary, and uh, that's just uh, the territory, I think. Okay. Risk and fear. Uh, <laughs> and, and sort of, I mean, I said years ago that writing is like following a whisper. I mean, it's just so, so it's such a tentative thing, in a sense, to sustain a novel. Um, and I think the material has to be incredibly compelling, at least for me, to sort of stay with it and go back to it, go back to it, go back to it. Um, so in that sense, this book has been a little different. Um, I think the writer always makes a kind of pact with the characters, with the book. You're going to stick it out, you're going to get there. You have, you have sworn to do this, in a sense. And uh, I maybe have felt that even a little bit more because they had been real and because they were children. Hi. He's completely gone. Oh yeah. You, you, I mean, I think in the book you kind of, the, the ending was a complete, the information in the ending was a complete surprise to me. It was not a part of the story that anybody, I think, knew. Um, so, yeah, not haunted by him at all. Gone. <laughs> Those who are spiritually superior won. There's, there's a question over here. Thank you so much. Um, and my question is, um, and I'm not one who likes labels, but um, when Truman Capote came out with his book, in quote one, he felt compelled to describe it as um, non-fiction novel, because he got a lot of people saying, so what is this? And how do you invent the imagine and imagine the thoughts and feelings of people when you weren't there? And you've taken it one step further, which is you've not only done that, but you've invented characters and you've created, as the gentleman said earlier, this, this wonderful collection, maybe it's a mashup, but it's sort of an expression of a story in which facts are blended with fiction. And has anyone asked you, what do you call it, or do you, does that matter? Oh, it's definitely a novel. I mean, um, In Cold Blood was so preoccupied with his relationship with Perry and his continuing relationship with, uh, with Perry and lying to Perry, and, and the, you know, that was sort of at the center of it. And this was very different because um, it was more um, completely transforming the story, but yet staying true to the reality of the case. Um, not what happened, but what it meant. Whereas I think Capote was very much involved in what happened. Um, this sort of starts with what happens and moves beyond it or a little deeper, I hope. <laughs> Uh, th that it was partially based on nonfiction elements. Did that make it easier to sell it to into the world, like you know, to a publisher? You know, is it is it easier to do that <laughs> with it based on nonfiction than literary fiction that you've written before? Uh, I don't know. We should ask my publisher that question. She's here tonight. No, wait, I won't do that. Uh, <laughs> 
think I probably was able to sell the book because of the books I had written before. Um, I think it was intriguing, you know, the idea of something that's based on a real story. And of course, when I took the book to Nan Graham, or my agent took the book to Nan Graham, we turned it in with, uh, I don't remember how many pages, but quite a few pages that were already written. So you felt the tone of what the book might be. Um, now we are hoping for a movie deal. Absolutely. <laughs> Because it's such, it's such a story, um, it would be, it's so pictorial. Um, it's right there. I mean, the gallery on my website. Um, it's uh, endless, just, just all there. So, um, I don't know, I mean, I think people are, are much more comfortable with nonfiction and maybe more interested in it. Um, but I think it's really important that we as a culture continue to understand narrative. Uh, the movement of a narrative, the arc of a story, uh, and you lose that a bit with, um, with nonfiction. There's a story, but it's a story you already know in a sense. And inventing something, whether it's based on reality or not, is a different feat of the imagination and it exercises different muscles for the writer and the reader. And I think it's important to read fiction. We have time for just one more down here in the front. Hi, Jamie. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> it's been said that, that fiction presents the truth better than history, journalism, memoir, etc. And without sliding down the slippery slope of what is truth, <coughs> may I ask, um, did you grapple with uh, how to weight the information you had and the, and the things you wish to invent. Was that a, and I'm asking about the writing process. Did you find yourself spinning <coughs> something out and then pulling some of it back to other pieces or elements? Balancing the fictional against the so-called actual. Not really. I would say that my guide was always the invention um, I was moving toward that because I really didn't have that much real information and I didn't do any more research than I absolutely needed to do. It all had happened so long ago um, and yet it was so intensely, it became so intensely real. I mean, I was telling Lloyd that Powers does not, he vanishes, he's nothing. But while I was writing the book, that wasn't really the case. Um, at one point in the book, um, someone is selling a relic, a murder relic. And this is based on something real. Um, a close family friend knew that I had referenced the Quiet Dell events in my first novel, very obliquely. Um, in the scene where the mother falls asleep in the graveyard, she drives up by her mother's grave, and she has this dream that references you know, this experience of walking past this garage where something terrible happened. Uh, and he gave me, he found in an antique dresser in a house in Rock Cave, West Virginia, a house that he'd purchased, a little envelope. And across the envelope, it was written in pencil, a piece of soundproof board from the murder farm of Harry Powers, August 1930. And inside the envelope is a little square with a three on it. Yes, it gives you chills, doesn't it? Um, and the fact that, you know, he gave, and it, it is in the book. Um, unbelievable. And, and such a, hu I mean, people still do this kind of thing. Such a, people, you know, humanity can be so base and so celestial. And they stand side by side. It's amazing. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you all for really happy to see all of you.